ask an obvious question, first of all, really, because we're talking about depression and why people feel down a lot of the time, and why perhaps sometimes the funniest people, I mean, I was, I was thinking particularly at that moment of Tony Hancock, who was a very tragic man, very, very sad man, but one of the funniest ever. It just would appear to be that uh, funny people are, are depressives. If you take out the head count in the world, you find that is not the case. You find they are in the minimals. A little, a little, yeah. yeah. They're, they're minimals, but it just so happens, you know, our people seem to latch on to that, you know. It's the classic reinvention of the story of uh, the clown, the sad clown. It goes like Pagliaccio. But you said... Somewhere I read, you said that the, the goon show took more out of you and upset you more than practically anything you ever did. Yet, yet that's something well, that lives Well, it only in... contributed to the fact that during the war I'd been blown up and called battle, fat uh, battle fatigue, mm. or in the old world terms, bomb, ha bomb happy. And uh, it was aggravated by the tremendous intensity of amount of work that I put into writing the goon show. I used to write for oh, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours a day, and at any time... I was obsessed with writing them. Did you feel that, that perhaps the, the powers that be and the people who, who, who uh, gave you the money, if you like, to do the shows is now sometimes didn't really have a clue what was going on? Does that, was that upsetting you or not? Absolutely right. They hadn't a clue. I was called difficult. That's the word for manic depression with the BBC. Yeah, yeah. He's awfully difficult. Uh, and uh, I suppose in the long run, in the long run, when I was in a maniacal mood, I was actually turning over much better than when I wasn't. Do you, I mean, you know now, obviously, you didn't perhaps not then, but you know now that, that uh, manic depression is an illness and it's not, uh, there's no particular reason why sometimes... Oh, it's better like than that. an illness. It's the top one. Is it? Yes, yep. I'm one of the top illnesses. Yes, it is. It's amazing how since... Since the last 50 years, I suddenly realized there was this great strata of people with this illness which nobody seemed to accept as being rational. But now, of course, we have the Manic Depressive Fellowship, and uh, there's hundreds and thousands of people who are Manic Depressives. Do you know when you're going to... I mean, you seem quite high at the moment. I mean, do you, do you know when you're going to go into a, a down state? No, it, uh, there's no, no pre-warning at all. Suddenly, there it is. It's like an accident. You have a, you have a medical accident, and uh, there you are. And it affects different people in different ways. Some people get tremendous highs over the top, and other people go very down like this. But uh, with a new drug called um, lithium, which is a godsend to many people. I'm on lithium. That's why I'm reasonably stabilized at the moment. Do, I mean, when, <laughs> when, when people have read about the fact that you've, you've been a psychiatric hospital from time to time. Yeah. And when, when you're quite open about it, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't talk about it, obviously. Do they treat you in a slightly different way? Do they sort of say, oh, well, we won't to worry too much about Spike because he can't help it? Or I don't know, you see. I don't know what well, there's two ways people approach me. They'd say, oh, I've seen you on television. They'd never say, I know that you're a manic depressive. <laughs> Most of them say, oh, I've seen you on telly last night. I suggest, did you see me being a manic depressive? Oh, no. Well, there you go, I'd say. <laughs> when someone says, and, and they, uh, they do, because they say the silliest people, we all say the silliest things, but when they say, come on, pull yourself together, or, or close friends, you would say, come on, you haven't got anything to worry about. Why are you depressed about money and the end of the world? James, have you thought, what operation would you go about pulling yourself together? Where would you start <laughs> pulling? It's silly. It's no a silly, it's a what silly, you do, silly thing, together. yeah. No, it, but it was a cliche. My father would say, pull yourself together. And I said, I... I'm, I'm all in one piece, Dad. It's as close as I can get together will ever be. You meant me having this mm. depression and going away. Did your parents understand you? No, they're dead, so they're safe from it. They're safe. But yeah. when they were alive, did they understand you? When they're alive, no. My father, my mother understood it, yes. But my father, he thought I ought to pull... <laughs> pull yourself together. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about that. Yes, I... Where are the straps? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember when you went into a psychiatric hospital, first of all, what it was like? Yes, I yes, at Woodside Park Psychiatric Hospital. Yeah, I remember that. I was a very bad, I was a very bad way, if you can mm. say that. Me. And uh, decimated. I could hardly move. And they put me to sleep. A thing called deep narcosis. They put you to sleep for three weeks, and that's supposed to end the trauma, the children. Fortunately enough, it it did. When I came to, I felt better. But I, I thought I'd been put to sleep for years because while I was asleep, they didn't shave me. 
and I grew a beard. Mm. So I thought I was like a Rip Van Winkle. I thought, wait a minute, how long have I been in here? And they'd show me newspapers. I said, these aren't today's newspapers. These are old ones. And well, how long have I been here? So then in the end, they got the radio and played it to me. But I didn't really, I thought I'd been in there forever. Mm. A bit terrifying feeling as well, yeah. When you first went in, you were already well known. Not, not, not quite, no. This is about 1953. Mm. Just starting to get well known. Like my mother and father were saying hello to me. <laughs> Did that have a difference, do you think? Because you read some tragic stories now of people who, who go into psychiatric hospitals yeah. and get forgotten. I'll tell you a story about Roehampton Priory. When I was in there, one of my loony jaunts, oh, we're coming back home again, they'd say. And I found a medical book. And this process was nice. And in it, it was all admissions from 1850, but the book was locked. But I found a key and opened it. And in it was Lady Millington Singh, admitted 1850. Uh, Dementia Precox. 1851, no change. 1853, no change. And it went like this until 1880. All she was her whole life was a series of entries in the book. God, how tragic. Of course, they didn't know. They had mind-bending drugs in those mm. days that might have helped her. What about now, electric shock treatment and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, they put you under. It didn't do me any good. Uh, but I, 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 did, I, did, I did say, well, they use as much electricity as possible because I had shares in uh, Eastern Electricity. <laughs> <laughs> But it didn't. It didn't do anything for me at all. It put me out like yeah. this, and then you, you came to it. They, they meant well, but then so did Hitler. Yeah. There, was, um, there seemed to be a lot of tragedies. Reading, reading interviews again about you, there seemed to have been a lot of tragedies in your life that, I mean, most people would have become depressed at. And it, it seems that they kind of built up as well. I never had any, James, I never had any different tragedy as such. Not like uh, being run over or having an accident, you know. It's, I suppose the manic depression is a bit of a tragedy in itself. But I never had, a, except from a, a divorce from my first wife, uh, which I thought was a tragedy. Your second wife died. Yeah, that was, mm. yes, that was a tragedy, of course. If you just remind me, I've forgotten about that. That's right, yeah. Well, I suppose I did have tragedies, yes. I mean, I also so, read somewhere that you had. How about World War II as a tragedy? World War II was Not a, big a bad tragedy, one, eh? Of course, yes. Yeah. Um, how would you describe depression to somebody who's it, only ever been perhaps just a little like, sad? It's like suddenly something might trigger it off, like a, a cruel word, a cruel gesture, or something which upsets you. And you don't get upset like ordinary people. You go out of this world into, a, into this world of complete depression. And it robs you of all energy, all effort, and all sex drive. That's the thing they say in psychiatry, that when your sex drive comes back, then you're cured. Well, mine has never come back. Well, mind you, I haven't driven it very far these days. <laughs> mine has never come back, but I, I am in a better state of mind than I used to be. The interesting thing, of course, is people are going to say, even when you're depressed, or uh, you still are making people laugh. Yes. Usually at your own expense. I have, I have been on the stage in a mortal depression and, uh, and made them laugh. How or why, I don't know. Am I the consummate artist of all time? Are you? No, I was asking you the question. That was how it was in the... And another thing that happens with it, as there's nothing good happening in your life at all, nothing at all, you see all the nice things like your children through a, through a mist, you know, you're not really enjoying them like you should, you're on a depression, you're not enjoying your children, even though they're standing there, you're not enjoying them. The depression is too great, too overwhelming. And what happens is, you suddenly try to think away to things that were nice in your past, and the nostalgia is almost as huge as... Quasimodo's hump. It's enormous, the nostalgia. The nostalgia is so great that it even depresses you even more. Because you're remembering of a good time. You think, wait a minute, that good time is gone. It'll never come back again like this. There's an ominous weight, yeah. It, it, uh, 
That, that's how it affects me, mind you. I don't know how it affects anybody else. How do you think it affects your wife? It does affect her. She has to tread gently and just has to go on loving me. And I don't shout and scream or anything like that. I don't do anything that would frighten anybody. But she has to pay attention to me when I'm in bed. And see Some, I, sometimes some of the stories that have appeared about you, particularly about when you've, you've been depressed in the, in the news, have been very writing about you in a very sort of negative way. No, sometimes. I've never had any reporter be nasty to me. And my father was an old journalist, and he said, never turn a reporter away. A reporter away. You know, do you know what it's like to stand for 14 hours in the rain outside a house to try and get a story? So I've always been on good terms with, with the, the, the media, you know, generally speaking, yeah. I, I also read that you were worried, you, you, you said uh, you, you, you couldn't save money, you had to go out, your overdraft was the next performance, I think, or something like that. I, did, I did run short of money, and uh, I kept getting this letter, continued from the bank, saying, you're overdrawn by a thousand pounds. So I would write back and tell them, thanks very much for telling me, you know. <laughs> then another one would come, and this went on for about four or five weeks, these letters were coming. And then they wrote, said, to me, I don't think you understand, we're asking you to close this overdraft, you know. So I wrote, and I said, listen, once a month, I put all my creditors' name on a piece of paper, <laughs> and I rolled up and I put them in a hat, and I draw one out, and I pay off that bill. And I said, if you don't stop bothering me, I won't put your name in the bloody hat. What are they saying? They haven't answered that one. <laughs> I do think, think they're going to send me a hat. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that the fact that you feel so... I mean, you're, you're a, a, a committed vegetarian now. Yeah. And I, I wasn't committed. I mean, they didn't say I commit you to be a, a court Christian. No, but Spike you feel strongly about I commit it. you to be a vegetarian. You feel very strongly about it. Yes, I do. I went and saw a, an animal veal calf and a chicken broiler unit. And I, I, sorry, if you just, just one little bit of sense to me, you, you, I can't subscribe to this killing. And I've survived now for 15 years just eating vegetarian food. Mm. And look what happens to you, Fox. <laughs> <laughs> but people might say, you see, that this is all part of uh, the, the illness of depression, that, that everything becomes so much more acute to you. That you feel uh, everything more. I yes, mean, I'm I, am, uh, I am very acutely aware of my environment. I'm, I, I like, I feel I'm a skin short, you know. I mm. feel cold before anybody else. Mm. I feel heat before anybody else, you know, like this. And uh, during the war, I could hear shells coming when all my mates couldn't. So they were to watch me. When I threw myself on the ground, <laughs> they knew one was on its way. Mind you, I tricked them then. I said, listen, this, this gift of mine is too good to go unpaid. I want one cigarette of all of you, otherwise I will not throw myself to the ground when I hear a show coming. I didn't do very well. I did get a few cigarettes. Yes. Did you, um, um, did you sign the, the Oath of Allegiance to get your, your citizenship and Prince Charles? Well, no, was... no, I was British in the war. They sent me to the war as a British soldier. And then some idiot, idiot, idiot um, diplomat or the war, foreign office changed the law so that any, any man born of a father whose father was born in Ireland before 1900 was now no longer British. So I said to this chinless wonder at the foreign <laughs> office, what are you? Well, you look like nothing at all, really. You'll have to, uh, you'll have to uh, apply again. I said, what? Well, said, well, you'll write in. I said, no fears, no way. I'm not going to write in. Go to stand in a room full of, full of foreigners of every colour, creed, race, name and things and me in the middle saying, I promised to take an oath of allegiance <laughs> to being British. <laughs> so you, I, you, I went to the Irish Embassy and I said, can I be one Irish citizen? And he said, oh, Jesus, yes, we're awful short of people. <laughs> so I joined him and we had two glasses of, of whiskey and uh, then I became Irish. I'm very pleased with it. You say you are, you're an Irish citizen? I'm right? an Irish citizen, ah, yes. yes. <laughs> are, you, are you pleased that Prince Charles is such a big fan of yours? I think Does it make any difference? I don't think this is true. He's not a big fan of mine. He just knows about me. That's about it. You've mm -hmm. met him, haven't you? Yes, I've met him. Yes. But, I mean, do, do you like the You won't believe this, but I, owing to the sleeping arrangements at his house, <laughs> I slept on the lavatory floor. Did you? Yeah. Oh. 
Well, no, I'm not going to say the obvious. No, 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 no. Not many people know that. Are you lonely? Yes. I've always been lonely, but I don't know why. Yet you've got four children. You have a family. Yeah. And and, and lots of fans. You walk down the street, people are going to say, Hi, Spike, how are you? No, they don't. They say to me, You're Eric Sykes, aren't you? (laughs) Well, I don't mind that. (laughs) But then those chap who said to me, You're Peter Sellers. I said, no. I said, he's dead. He said, oh, no, he isn't. So I thought, I don't mind being mistaken for somebody alive, mm. but I don't want to be mistaken for a corpse. One has one pride in being alive, you know. <laughs> why, do you think, <clears throat> why do you think you're lonely? Do you think this is part of your, your, your depression? Maybe yes, James. Maybe yes. I, it's very mysterious. It's, my illness is possibly the most mysterious thing that's happened to me because I don't understand it. It is a total mystery here. Even though you've talked to some very eminent people about it and you've been into, into hospitals? It's, I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty literate person. You know. Sure, but I mean... And uh, so I've never been short about talking about it. it Make the more... It's very nice sometimes when somebody comes when you're on a mental home or the psychiatric ward. Or they don't like to call it a mental or home the now, or the loony clinic. bin is out as well. I clinic, know. it's garden clinic. I... Uh, when people, nurses would come in, sometimes they'd sit down and talk to me while I was ill, you know. And that was very, very nice that someone was talking to. Sometimes I wish they'd have buggered off, actually. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of letters in. We said we were going to do a programme on depression, and we mentioned it on the air. We had a, a, an enormous amount of letters. And the program am I, being, am I being serious enough about this? You're being fine. Everything's fine. And what we, we glean from the letters was that people seemed to think that they had one event in their life that had triggered off their depressive illness. That it was one thing that they just couldn't get out of their, their mind. Do you, feel, do you think it was the war for you? Do you think that was what set it up? Uh, I think it was latent in me, uh, James. All it needed was the trigger. Mm. And being blown up and, and taken to hospital with a sleep, uh, that set it off. I was all right after that, but I was always aware that I was not the same as I was before this incident in the war. Over the years, it's got quite bad, you know. I've, I've just come out of one, uh, which had lasted nearly two, two and a half years. In the end, I, you know, you do consider suicide as a very pleasant option, and that all that stopped me doing it was the fact I could suddenly see all my children standing around my grave crying, my wife and all that. Uh, so I just sort of like, I couldn't do that to them, you know. You believe in euthanasia, though, don't you? I read somewhere that you... Yes, I think, yes. I've, I've said to my family, yeah. if ever I get to a stage where there's no point in me living, you pull the plug. Yeah. Do you think it should be legalised? Do you think I I'm think a... it should be legalised. It's, it's a... It's... A, if you really love someone enough, you will kill them. I totally agree with you. Yeah. What would you say, Spike, to somebody who is depressed watching this? I mean, what, what sort of help or what advice would you give somebody? I'd say here's a bottle of 100 milligram lithium pills. Take one a day. You'd say go and see a doctor, basically, and, and rather than just... A lot of people live with their depression. Feel well, there's I'd, nothing you can I'd do about it. I'd say that. go and see a pretty girl. At, uh, much better than what I'm talking about. No, uh, you can see a doctor, doctors don't do this, a psychiatrist knows about the tablets uh, and the vast range of these tablets, there are those which of course, which are addictive, which you must avoid, and those which are genuinely good drugs. You, we do need, I realise after all these years, that just going and seeing a psychiatrist and saying I don't feel well and relaxed on it, you do need these mind-bending drugs, they are beneficial.